Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we've got Lance Kronberger of Freelance Outdoor Adventures in Alaska. Lance, how you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, it's I'm excited to have you on the show today. We've got the Alaska hunting deadline, uh, I believe, is due Thursday, um, December 15th, coming up here in a few days. And I wanted to uh, go over some of the Alaska draw uh, applications and how to apply. I wanted to go over some of the Alaska hunts that you can just buy over the counter. I uh, wanted to talk to you about specifically some of the top uh, doll sheep uh, units uh, that you guide in. And not only that, maybe some units that you don't guide in, uh, maybe get some feel from you on you know, populations, mountain ranges, severity of hunts, different things. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, can you give me like a little brief synopsis of, um, you know, maybe where you grew up, how you started hunting in Alaska and kind of how you got to where you're at now with your company, Freelance Outdoor Adventures? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, I didn't, uh, I didn't take the traditional path to becoming a guide, you know, everybody has a little different path. I, I wasn't raised, um, hunting. I, I wasn't, my dad wasn't a big hunter. I was raised on a dairy farm and playing sports my entire life. And, uh, when I was in, you know, like a typical kid growing up on a farm, you know, you shoot a deer here or there, but it was never trophy hunting. It was, it was all about, you know, just killing something and, and putting some meat on the table. But um, got into archery elk hunting when I was in college and, and played college basketball for four years and um, was just about time to graduate and decided, man, having a desk job just wasn't going to work. And, and like I said, playing sports had been what I'd done. And uh, so there was an ad in the Bugle magazine for a guiding packer school in, uh, in Salmon, Idaho. I sent my money in and um, ended up going to a guide school because you couldn't get a job in the wilderness dealing with horses without having some horse experience. And I didn't know anything about packing and shoeing and, and dealing with, uh, the horses and mules. So that's what I did. And, um, once I got out there, I kind of discovered, uh, this was something I could do. And it kind of, you know, fueled my competitive nature. Cause I, it's interesting because as a guide, I, I look at each hunt kind of it's like a like a sports game you either win or you lose and sometimes you win big and sometimes you know you barely win and sometimes it's pretty and sometimes it's ugly but you know in in my profession no one no one spends the kind of money to come out and do an alaska hunt or, or any of these big western hunts with the expectations of i'm going to go home empty-handed you're you know there's definitely a measuring stick and so anyway that's kind of what i did and i i went everywhere i did anything I could to get into the industry and uh, went everywhere from, you know, helping with mule deer and coos deer in Mexico to chasing mountain lions in the winter and, and ended up uh, getting a job as a packer in Alaska and um, came up and did a sp spring brown bear and just uh, trying to fill my season and um, traveling and doing a bunch of different states and went to Tajikistan and helped out over there and um, I just realized what I thought was the, the greatest hunting adventures was in Alaska. And so, um, in 2003, we started freelance outdoor adventures and I moved up here full time in 2004 and, uh, you know, never looked back. And, um, it was, it was great because I worked for about, you know, I worked for about 10 years for a dozen different outfitters all over the place. So when I started my own business, um, I kind of took what I thought was the best of what everybody else did and, and all their experience and, uh, and trying to put it with what would work for, for me and, um, have modified it a little bit, but, uh, we've been in, we've been in business now for 13 years and I've been guiding for 22 years and this is, this is what I know and this is what I do. That's awesome. Uh, so when you grew up on a dairy farm, uh, I don't think I heard what state you grew up in. Where where did you actually grow up? I grew up in Oregon, Oregon. and I uh, okay. grew up in Western Oregon. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of people think I'm from Idaho, but I grew up in Oregon and uh, I went to college in Oregon. And as soon as done with school, I headed to Idaho. But, um, you know, one thing about growing up on a dairy farm, 
I figured if I'm going to have to get up early in the morning, I'm going to get up excited about it each day. And, and that wasn't the case growing up on a dairy. <laughs> you had to make yourself do it, didn't you? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, Lance, not only um, are you a guide uh, in Alaska, an outfitter, guide, outfitter. I mean, you go on a bunch of the hunts yourself, so you're a guide and you're an outfitter, so you set up some of the hunts. But you have also guided and outfitted, in essence, kind of all over the world, uh, and, and certainly a lot in the lower 48, Mexico. Um, what other countries? What other? I mean, you, you, you kind of your spectrum is fairly broad, although you're you also focus. Uh, very well on doll sheep and brown bear and grizzly and moose and goats, but you also kind of have a broad umbrella too. Can you talk to me a little bit about the balance of what you do and over the years, what, you know, some of the adventures that you've been on in some of the different places and how it all kind of plays together? Yeah, you know, what's interesting is, is I didn't, you know, it was never this plan of, of, you know, kind of finding your niche, but this is all we do. My, our whole family, me and my wife, we are a hundred percent supported in the guiding and outfitting industry. And, you know, as a, in Alaska, it's a little bit different um, than places in lower 48. There's not, not many of the outfitters are actually guides. They're kind of managers, they're pilots. Um, and that works for their business. Well, that, it's not in my skill set. I enjoy being out there with the client, sleeping on the ground, sleeping in the tent, um, going on the stock. I enjoy the hunt. I enjoy the challenge, and, and I really enjoy when we're successful. So because of that, um, the relationships that are formed are formed when you're in the trenches. Um, you know, when, when you're packing that brown bear or that doll sheep out, and it's raining and blowing sideways, and it's late at night, you make these bonds. And, um, guys, you develop these relationships of trust and friendship. And so what's, it's enabled me to make some contacts where people have, have said, Hey, I want to go do this, or I want to go, um, hunt in other places, uh, especially for sheep. Sheep, I believe is one of the places is, is one of the animals that if you're a sheep hunter, you can go to a lot of places. You don't have a lot of time and history in. And it may take you a little while to figure it out, um, but because it's so glassing intensive, it's so trophy judging intensive, it's not like you're trying to pattern an animal. You need to know what you're looking at and, and being able to use your glasses. And so that enables me to go to a lot of places I may have not spent a lot of time in um, and, and help out. I, I just returned from uh, being down in Montana um, there's an Indian reservation down there. I've hunted a couple of times and, and I had a 15 year old girl and her dad has hunted with me 28 times. And he just said, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm getting old and I want to see my kids get their slam and I want to go on the hunts with them. And so we went down there and she got her first sheep. And those are the types of things I do in lots of different States. Um, I've guided sheep in almost all of the, the Western States. But when I, when I say guided a lot of times, I'm not, I'm going along on the hunt. I'm in charge of, you know, making sure we don't shoot the wrong animal that, you know, that we're judging it, that we're, um, field scoring up before we pull the trigger. And, and I've kind of just carved out that niche and, and making those relationships with those guys, um, is what it's all about. And, and that's something I really enjoy. I can imagine, um, with that situation where you're coming along, most of your clients obviously are probably high, high profile, high net worth individuals, some maybe more than others, um, but you're coming along to kind of oversee everything. Uh, you know, ha have there been situations or I guess the question is, how do you handle sometimes when you're playing your role and you're. Uh, in essence, protecting and looking out for your client's best interest, but not just for that hunt, like 28 times he trusts you to come and, you know, help make things go smooth. How do you also balance that with the guides that you're going with? Uh, in essence, sometimes they may think, oh, Lance is trying to swoop in here and, 
you know, steal our thunder or, you know, it seems like it's a it's a place where bitterness could could come in there. And I, I, I know your reputation, so I know you probably have a great way of handling that situation. I'm just curious how you do. Yeah, it's it's always a challenge, but it it always starts those those things also start with the same way I approach the clients that book hunts directly with us here in Alaska. Communication is huge. Um, it's gotten to the point now where I've made a lot of relationships with these guides and these outfitters. And so, you know, we go back to places I've been, but the first time I go somewhere and I'm, I'm working with an outfitter, um, you know, you guiding is a ego driven business and I, I, there's, there's no way around it. The best guides have large egos and, and you can use that as a plus and you can also use that as a minus. So there's a balance that has to be struck there. You, I'm very cautious about not going in there and trying to run the hunt. Um, you know, it's interesting because guys always like, so I'm going there and I am the non-hunter tag along. I'm taking lots of pictures. If a guy has a video camera. Um, I'm running this video camera. Basically, I am never second guessing the guides because that's where that's where things go wrong. the The problems, the things that I am, are when, especially in other countries where their reputation isn't as important and their 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 trophy quality is not um, as important as it is here in the States is when you're going to another country and they see one that's average and they say, shoot that. Um, it's, it's, there's a very nice way to say, you know, can we just try to find something a little bigger? Um, and then you always hear of, you know, I went over there and I shot the wrong one, whether it be whatever hunt they're on. That's where, where I've been with these guys and I, you know, and, and I'm with them and, and I do not want that to happen to where when we're looking and he's looking through a scope, you know, there's a lot of communication. And since we've hunted together, we're on the same wavelength to make sure um, that that doesn't happen where we shoot the wrong one. I mean, mistakes can happen. And I'm not saying that, you know, it's 100% that that never happens. But we, the miscommunication, especially when you're dealing with a language barrier, um, can be can be an issue. So that's that's where I'm uh, trying not to step on anybody's toes. And then comes in the, the, the animals dead and everybody's there. And I am very into pictures and I think hunters are, they've spent all this money or let's take it a step further. A guy who's drawn his first time sheep tag, he's drawn Arizona and, and I've, I've, he's hunted something else with me. Maybe he's hunted a moose or a goat with me. And he's just like, Lance, can you just come along? Cause I don't know if I'll ever get this tag again and I need, I need help documenting it because they've seen the attention to detail on taking photos because when it's all said and done, yeah, they got their animal and it's mounted in their house, but their photo album of their experiences is is an important part of, of telling that. And I think we can all appreciate the amount of time and money and energy we spend researching hunts. And then when you go on the hunt, spending a little more time, and money and uh to make sure that i'm it's documented um when it's all said and done you know guys really really enjoy that and then we we go into the trophy um preparation you know um these guys they they want to make sure that that thing ends up as um, most of the time a life-size mount in their house um there's there's all the horror stories that they lost my cape or they didn't take care of my cape and the hair slipped and so i'm very involved in in all of that so when it's all said and done um the guides know that if i'm coming along i'm not taking their tip they're going to get tipped they're going to be taken care of i'm going to make sure that the pictures that get submitted are of them and i am um not trying to steal their thunder and, and if anything trying to uh, promote them so i think i've figured out a way to strike a, a good balance and be able to go on these awesome adventures that I normally wouldn't get to go on. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like to me, in essence, it's almost as if 
the client of yours that you've hunted with so many times, or maybe someone chooses to, you know, hire you. This is your first hunt that you've done with them. But in essence, you're almost like a, a son of theirs or daughter of, you know, you're, you're a sibling of theirs that has their best interest. So you're trying to make sure that everything, you know, the photos, the video, that their animal gets taken care of, that it gets caped properly, just any little thing that you could help because of your experience level, you're 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 in essence looking out for almost like a father figure of yours, where you're you're like taking the extra care. Not that the guide or the other outfitter isn't, but you're kind of there to to round out and kind of help in all of those areas where some guides and some outfitters have. You know, everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, it sounds like you're just there to, uh, you know keep everything uh rolling along keep everything positive and lend a hand in any place you can and document the hunt and make for a for a better experience that's great i mean i think that's fantastic yeah i end up i end up being a lot of times a go-between and yeah. and like you said these guys who have hunted with me a lot you know you got i got certain clients that like hey i know they don't want to be riding a horse in the dark but they're not going to you know, lay down the law for the guide off the bat. And I'm there. I just say, Hey man, this is a guy. He just doesn't do well. You know, riding a horse in the dark. We try to make sure we're back at camp before dark. And, and the guides are always, are always good with that. And, and I try to present it in a way that, but there's all these little things. And you know, there's certain guys that, you know, they need to be, you know, they can't be living on burritos and jalapenos. I mean, and so if we're going to Mexico and we're doing something like that, they don't know that they're not going to have a Snickers bar for lunch. So I bring stuff like that because it, in the scheme of things, it make the, makes the hunt much more enjoyable. But I don't know how many guys have come back and said, man, you know, I got, I got an animal, but it would have been more enjoyable. And all the stuff they list are things that come second nature for me taking care of. Yeah, makes total sense. Let's take a quick break here. GoHunt.com Insider is by far the most valuable tool a Western hunter could give themselves. GoHunt.com Insider are the industry leaders and number one source for Western hunting for a lot of reasons. GoHunt.com Insider have changed the game for how hunts and hunting information are found. Within a matter of minutes using filtering 2.0, you'll be able to filter by state, species, residency, odds of drawing a tag, specific hunting dates, and harvest success percentages to find the hunts that fit exactly what you're looking for. If you are a guy that applies across the West or just in your home state but want to find some new opportunity, there's no better way to do it than using GoHunt.com Insider. As an exclusive offer to my listeners, if you sign up for a GoHunt.com Insider membership for $149 a year and use the promo code JSCOTT, at checkout, you'll receive a $50 Kuyu gift card. Head on over to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and get yourself the most valuable membership a hunter could have. Okay, Lance, I want to dive into with this draw coming up, um, have you walk through a little bit about the one thing that I, I, I it's hard for me to get my arms around is from what I understand, there's draw doll sheep hunts and then there's hunts that you can just buy and i may be wrong in that and then there's there's you know a brown bear grizzly bear moose goat and you can draw some of those and then you can buy them so maybe kind of walk through the whole process and um, i understand your wife nikki she takes care of lo a lot of these applications for hunters and, and 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 maybe just kind of go through the whole uh draw process and the over-the-counter you know just oh yeah pay the money and you can come hunt xyz animal with me gotcha so the the outfitters in the state of alaska um each outfitter or registered guide is how it's term there's a terminology for up here is allowed to have three areas. Um, and so uh, Freelance Outdoor Adventures has uh, me as a registered guide and our right-hand man, John Rydeen. And John has worked for us for 12 years. So that enables us to offer hunts in places that are draw and we have no guarantee. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons we can hunt toke 
and 14C. Now, in the state of Alaska, there are many places that you can just go and buy a Doshi putt from a registered guide or outfitter in that area. We do not have any of those areas. Um, and the, the, the number one reason we do not is because um, the residents of Alaska can go into those areas over the counter and they can kill a sheep every year. And so you never know the amount of pressure you're going to get in your area. Um, back when we very first started, we had a couple areas that were just over the counter and it turned into you, you were always trying to keep it a secret because um, residents would find out and then they'd kind of flood those areas and things like that. And I've kind of just taken the approach that I would rather take fewer hunters knowing we were going to have high success than take more hunters that I could just book, but not knowing um, the amount of pressure that was going to be in that, in the area. So in Alaska, if you wanted to go and buy a doll sheep pump from a registered guide in the Brooks range, the Alaska range, the Wrangles, um, trying to think, uh, the Talkeetnas, you can go and do that. And you can just book a hunt and, and go. With us, you have to draw a tag in either 14C or Toke. And we kind of look at those as being the two um, best areas in the state. There's multiple hunts within each of those areas, but those are areas we've become real familiar with. We've been hunting them for the last 10 years, and our success in the trophy quality has been really good, and, 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 and we feel comfortable that we can offer uh, a great hunt in those areas. Okay. Specifically in those areas, I know you get people calling you, asking you all the time, all right, Lance, which units am I putting in for? Can you give me kind of those, uh, the toke and 14C, can you kind of break them down a little bit? Tell me about each one, you know, the characteristics that make one different than the other. Okay, we'll start off with 14C, which is in the Chugach Mountains. And I live in 14C, um, right up against Chugach State Park. Um, so within the Chugach State Park, 14C, it is a no-fly zone. So you can fly over, but there's no places that you can land in there. So it's all done from going to a trailhead and packing in. The Chugach is the most rugged doll sheep hunting in the world. So, and the reason is, is because it's a coastal range. So the bottom thousand feet is choked with brush, devil's club, all their, all kinds of stuff. Um, you name it. And it can be an ugly, an ugly place to hunt. Um, another reason is it's a, the Chugach in, um, in the scheme of the earth are relatively new mountains. And so they are glaciated, um, very rocky. Uh, it's easy to get cliffed out. And because of that, you can't get above the brush one time and just stay above it and just keep on hunting. When you crawl up into a valley and you hunt that valley, um, lots of times you got to come back down the valley and go somewhere else. And so it's, it's not like, okay, we just got to get above the brush once and then we can cruise for the next 10 days. Um, the Chugach doesn't allow that because of the way the mountains are structured. Um, the Chugach mountains 14 C has a reputation for great trophy quality in the sense that the sheep tend to have a little bit bigger bases. The hardest animal in the world to put in the record book is a doll sheep. There's not anything that's even close. Um, and, and when guys call up and they ask, hey, put me in for a spot, I have a chance at a record book doll sheep, I tell them we don't have any of those areas. Um, it's just, you know, there's been, you know, less than, it will, in the last 10 years, there's been less than 10 book ramps come out of 14C. Um, it's just one of those things that's, that's really, really difficult to put in the in the record book. But we tend to have a little bit bigger bases. The 14C rams tend to broom more so than other places just because of the horn configuration. Um, because of living in 14C and hunting there so much, 
we have trails through the brush. We have lots of places that we can get above the brush. And uh, we do a lot of preseason scouting um, that allows us to try to minimize how physical the hunts can be. Mm-hmm. Along with that, each one of our hunts, uh, you get a guide and a packer. Because when we take off, we're taking off for 10 days. We have everything we need for 10 days. Uh, and uh, knock on wood, hopefully we don't need the whole 10 days. But that's what that's how we have to approach it because uh, being coastal, the weather can come in at any time and, and really affect a 14 sea hunt. I think most guys physically can handle a 14 sea hunt. The problem is uh, you better be mentally prepared that uh, it's going to suck sometimes. The weather's not going to be good and you're going to just have to put your head down sometimes and it's steep and nasty. But, um, last year we had two rifle hunters that drew. They both killed 11 year old Rams. They're both nice Rams. Had, had a great time the year before that we had, uh, the governor's tag in 14 C and, uh, two other draw hunters. Everybody killed a Ram. The, the governor's tag ended up taking a, a very nice sheep. And, um, the governor's tag is allowed to hunt one area in 14 C that there is no, um, there's no non-resident draw tag. So they give a, a little bit of, the, of a boost there, but, uh, 14 C is one of those places I tell guys, you, you, the hardest part of it is, is drawing the tag. And once you draw the tag, we'll get it figured out. We'll find a Ram and, and, and we'll try to find the best Ram we can. Okay. On the other side, you go, go to the toke. couple questions yeah. real fast on 14 C, just so I hear okay. you clear. Um, all of your 14 C hunts are riding horses in, uh, to a camp or is it everything on your back backpacking? Everything on your back backpacking. Okay. So you, you start at the trailhead, at no horses, you start at the trailhead and everything's on your back. You do have a packer. Is, is the packer also your guide or do you have a guide and a packer? You have a guide and a packer. Okay. So. Most of the time, like I say, it's most of the time you have two licensed guides. But usually what happens is I like to have my guides have lots of sheep under their belt before I ever turn them loose. So, you know, the packers aren't like we got some kid who's just carrying a backpack. They're glassing. They got, you know, they're doing everything to try to find you the best sheep also. And we will, most of the time when you show up, we will have already pre-scouted. We'll say, okay, uh, Jay, we found a sheep that we, you know, it's up in this basin. That's the, the best one we've seen so far. Let's go up there and, and take a look at him, see if you like him and things like that. Um, so that we're just not, hey, let's just go see what we can find because the Chugach will tear you up if you're just going to say, hey, we're just going to take off and, and go roaming for 10 days without having kind of a direction of, of, of where to get started. Okay. That that's fair enough. And then how many tags, um, are drawn each year in, in the Chugach or in 14 C how many total hunters or tags are allotted? Okay. So there's about 85 total tags, but of those 85 rifle tags, 12 go to non-residents. Okay. 12 go so, to non-residents. And, okay. And, the way that's set up is there's different 14 C is, is, is got five different units within it. And then those units have 13 day time slots. So if you're hunting Peter's Creek, which is a unit within 14 C, there's the first hunt, the second hunt and the third hunt. And so each one of them is a separate draw. Um, Alaska is, is, different and unique in its drawing application in that each you get six hunt choices. Each hunt choice is put into the hat separately. So your order between your first and your sixth choice, the only time that the order comes into play is if they draw two of your hunt choices, then you get your higher choice. Gotcha. Can you apply all six choices for one unit? So you have six chances for that or that specific area. This is the first year that they are allowing that. So yes, um, which that has, that has been a real benefit 
for guys who want to hunt a very specific spot. They just put all their choices into there. Gotcha. Okay. And what are generally the odds? I know this year with, with that new change, it's probably out the window, but what have been, uh, there's no preference points or bonus points, right? So it's just random, but you know, what is the average draw for those 12 non-residents? So the average draw is about 5% is your chance of drawing a doll sheep tag. Um, and if you want to boost your chances a little bit, you apply for the later hunts, the second or third season hunts. The first season hunts, your, your chances of drawing are probably going to be a little bit less than 5%. But um, So I have guys that kind of spread out their choices um, depending on what they want to do. But all of the hunts are... Um, sought after they're all good quality hunts so rule of thumb is is it's about a five percent chance of drawing okay okay um now let's move to i believe you were going to say the toke maybe explain where the toke is in relationship and then go go over the toke just like you did the chew gotcha gotcha so real quick the chew gotcha 14c is just outside of anchorage it's in South Central Alaska. Um, it's a long cook inlet, and that's when I say it's coastal. Whereas the Toke, the Toke is the eastern tip of the Alaska Range. So it's about, uh, if you're looking north and south, it's about halfway up Alaska towards the Canadian border. Um, it's about 100 miles uh, west of the Canadian border is what they call the Toke Management Unit. It is the only unit in the state that is managed for trophy quality. Um, 14C is not managed for trophy quality. 14C is managed as a draw because of vicinity to Anchorage. The TOKE has uh, specific guidelines to manage it for trophy management. The TOKE has been down for the last couple of years because we had uh, really hard winters in 11 and 12 where this last season was the first year we starting to see some sheep come back um we did real well in the toke we had uh, three hunters in there all three killed 10 year old rams and the average was over 40 so and we saw a lot of rams the toke does not typically have as heavy bases as a chugach the toke rams tend to look more like your canadian uh, type of sheep in your Brooks range where they don't broom as often. Um, they flare, they get full curl relatively quickly. They're not as heavy on the tips, but they're a beautiful looking ram. Um, the toke is, is usually has more, is better for length, but because of the bases doesn't score as well. The toke is not an area that uh, produces a 170 inch record book rams it's just it would never be a spot that you go looking for that type of sheep but if you want a great experience and a a real quality hunt the toke is physically different than the chugach we're not fighting brush when we get on top of the mountains we can generally navigate staying on top of the ridges the number of rams uh, in the toke is higher, um, but the chances of drawing in toke is less than 14C. Um, if you only said, I'm going to put in for the first hunt in toke, your chances of drawing are, are less than 2%. Okay. All of these hunts, Lance, uh, take place in what month or months? Okay, so they all take place pretty much in the month of August. So the, the, they, the seasons aren't the same between Toke and 14C on the second season. So both Toke and 14C, the first season opening day is August 10th. And then the second hunt in Toke starts August 26th. So if you drew the second hunt, we go into Toke August 23rd, and we try to be out before the 1st of September. Um, the Toke being farther north, when you start getting into the first part of September, winter can hit and, and never go away. 
in 14C, the first hunt starts August 10th. The second hunt starts August 23rd. And so we try to go into the field August 21st, and that hunt rolls into the first part of September. And uh, it's usually not as big a weather difference in 14C versus a toke. Okay. Um, and so the toke physically sounds like you're not fighting brush, um, more sheep. So that probably lends itself to why the draw odds are worse because the 14C Chugach, uh, it sounds like it's a little more rugged or not a little more, quite a bit more rugged and quite a bit more brush. The bases are bigger. You might find a little bit bigger sheep in 14C or the Chugach 14C. Uh, but toke just sounds like more of an all around, maybe just for, for, you know, newbies, so to speak, maybe a better experience if you're just wanting to go up and get your doll sheep. But 14C has the allure of maybe bigger base rams. You might find, you know, just a, uh, an all around bigger ram and hence the draws are a little bit better. You pretty much hit the nail right on the head. You know, the the other thing is, in in toke, there is uh, six non-resident tags. That's all there is. So that also what, what's adds the to why the draw is not. So there's six non-resident. The total how is many? sixty. Okay, okay, sixty. Okay, um, and and just so I'm clear, uh, guys can call. Uh, you or Nikki and you guys will handle all the paperwork of getting someone uh, that, that wants to apply for 14C or the toke and you guys will be working between now and, and Thursday and sometimes they extend the deadline but you're, you never count on that but you could get someone applied and uh, put in you can take care of everything yeah Alaska has got uh, regulation that before a guy can put in, he has to have a signed contract with a licensed guide before he can even apply. So guys can either email us or call us or, or go to our website and get our application because I have to have a signed contract with the guy that's applying. Um, and he has to have a contract through Freelance Outdoor Adventures. And then when we will take care of everything, we'll buy their hunting license and get them applied and do all that. We don't charge anything for it. We don't take any deposits and tell guys draw tags, but to apply, you have to have a special verification code that they give out to the licensed outfitters for those areas. Um, they're just trying to keep, uh, keep the draw honest. Um, we don't want any non hunters or anti hunters, uh, flooding the market and drawing tags and, and not actually going because these tags are, are non transferable. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Let's take a quick break here. And, um, then I'll, if you want to finish up anything on the doll, but then I also want you to hit on your, uh, brown bear, grizzly bear, moose, and goat hunts. So let's take a quick break. I have known the owners of the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix for over 20 years. They are the authority on optics and hunting gear. Outdoorsman's is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality tripods, mounting accessories, and pack systems for all hunters. Their customer service is the best in the business. Go to Outdoorsman's.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any products. Real Game Calls featuring the Elk Reel. Real Game Calls makes innovative, realistic, and easy to master calls using their proprietary, revolutionary design. They are located and manufactured in Gypsum, Colorado. Their calls were designed and battle tested on some of the hardest hunted terrain on earth. Check out elkreel.com. Use the promo code JSCOTT and receive a 20% discount on all purchases. Go to www.elkreel.com. Okay, Lance, do you feel like we covered the doll sheep uh, extensively? And if you want to add anything, feel free to do so. And then I'd like to ask you about your brown bear, grizzly bear, moose, and goat hunts that you also do. Yeah, the only thing I'd like to add on the doll sheep is 
doll sheep as a whole in North America, um, if you're ever thinking that you want to hunt doll sheep, I highly recommend guys apply. The application um, is right now it's the cost of a hunting license and then $5 per uh, application per area. So if a guy is to, to apply for six un- six choices, he's into it $115. Um, these are the, these are the least expensive quality doll sheep hunts. There are, if, if you start pricing what it's going to cost you to go hunt uh, the Brooks range or Northwest territories or any of the Canadian hunts where you have extensive travel. Um, these are, these are really nice hunts in that when you show up in Anchorage, we pick you up in Anchorage and go from there. And then we drop you off back in Anchorage, which I know for, for guys who are just getting started, once they realize the travel expenses on top of this, if you start tar- talking about charters or getting to real remote towns, it starts to add up. And so I just recommend, and I, I tell everybody that contacts me, if you're ever thinking about hunting doll sheep, this is the best qual. This is the best bang for your buck you're going to get. Good stuff. Let's talk about what else you guide for as well. Yeah. So, you know, the good Lord, I wanted to be the, sheep guide and go all over the place but uh, he put bears in my way and and after sheep they're my most favorite thing to hunt and i mean anytime you get to hunt something that can eat you it, it adds a whole new aspect and drama to to the hunt so we have a brown bear area down on the alaska peninsula um it's a remote area only accessed by super cubs um and we do brown bear hunts down there it's one of the best areas down there and and we have on his 10 foot bears. I, I never tell someone that they're going to get a 10 foot bear, but about 25% of the bears that we harvest, uh, are on his 10 foot bears. Um, population's good. Uh, the logistics and the weather are always an issue, but anytime you're going someplace, it's that remote where big bears live. Uh, that's one of the things that you have. One thing that I, I want to reiterate to guys who are thinking about hunting brown bear. Brown bear is the most boring hunt you'll ever be on. They're cool, and we all want one in our trophy room, and we like the pictures to show up. But, you know, I say you're coming sheep hunting, we're talking physical. You're coming brown here, I'm brown bear hunting, I'm talking mental. You've got to be able to stick with it because brown bear hunting is a, is a patience game. And so... Um, those are cool and those are lots of fun to hunt as long as guys understand man you're you're sitting and doing lots of glassing and you're not moving around it's not like a sheep hunt where if we go hard enough and we go long enough we can make it happen brown bear hunting is one of those things you got to let happen um so when you just a follow-up question on that when you say let it happen a typical brown bear hunt are you hiking up to a high point and you spend all day there glassing looking for uh, a, a brown bear that you want to harvest or are you are you looking all day and you may not see a bear for five days and then all of a sudden you see one i mean explain to me a little bit what you mean by that yeah a little bit of both yes we are we, are, we fly out to a spike camp we set up we set up camp and depending on what camp we're at and, and the time of year, spring and fall is a little bit different, but you're going to a glassing spot, and it's it's specific to a camp. It isn't like, well, we're just flying here, and we'll find a spot to look from. You're going to a high spot that you can see, and you're spending all day there. Um, the one thing about brown bears, brown bears are extremely sensitive to human scent. The only time we're out there is when we're hunting them. It isn't like they see us because... You know, they're running across us while we're hunting other things. The only time we're out there is when we're hunting brown bears. If they cross your path where you have walked, and it's two or three days since you've walked there, and they smell you that you've been there at all, a good, big, mature boar, he's leaving. Like, he's changing zip codes. Um, and, and everybody I, I tell this to, they kind of look at me, you know, funny, until we get up there, and it's like, ah. Oh, that bear's going to hit, hit our scent trail. And they get to see what happens when a bear hits the scent trail um, and turns inside out. And um, so we are very cautious about what we call stinking up a valley, not laying scent trails all over the place. You're going from your tent to your glass and up. And like you said, you're spending a lot of time just looking for 
That's the one. Um, let's go. We got to make it happen now. It would be rare that we go a day or two without seeing a bear. Um, I would say it's pretty rare that you don't see at least a bear a day. Um, but our average day is two to four bears, and, and it's not. Hey, there's you know. Then Ben comes in trying to find the trophy quality, and sometimes you got to look through a lot of bears before you find the one you want to shoot. But that's all. Um, that's what why we spend so much money on classes and and spot and scopes and making sure that we try to do the best we can at trophy judging before we decide to go after it. Awesome. That sounds like a hunt made for me. I love the glass and, um, sounds like a neat, what kind of country, like what, what is the terrain? Like you said a high point, but are you on the tundra or what, you know, timber or what, what, what are you looking at when you're doing this glassing? So we don't have a tree within a hundred miles and an evergreen tree because the wind blows way too much, but it is, there's, there's some coastline. There's all the stuff that's above what we call brush line. There's lots of alder. And when I say alder, that's down in the valleys and, and down all, along the coast and stuff, I mean, we're talking 10 feet of alder. I mean, these bears, they, they pull into the brush. You'll, you'll never see them until they come back out, but we got some wetlands we got lots of rivers. It depends. In the, in the fall, we're hunting the rivers. You're looking for a bear that's traveling either the beach or traveling the rivers, chasing fish or anything that's washed up on the beach. And so you're spending a lot of time glassing, looking down. In the spring, the bears can be anywhere. They're coming out of the dens. They're hungry. They're rutting. They're, they're just traveling. Um, so you'll find them up in the snow peaks, or you may find them down on the beach it just depends but you are you are looking at a, a a wide variety of terrain anywhere from like i said beach brush uh swamp all the way up into the the tundra that's above the brush line all the way up into the snowy rocky peaks um you know in the spring we've killed them everywhere and, and mostly in the fall we're killing them down down where they're looking for fish okay uh, question would be when you hunt them in the fall, what are the rough dates? And when you hunt them in the spring, what are the rough dates? Like what months are you? Okay. Hunting? Yep. The Alaska peninsula, uh, the fall hunts are in October. They're October 1st through 21st is the season in the spring. It's May 10th through May 31st. I will say the Alaska peninsula has a season, has one season per year. So on even numbered years. 2016, 2018, 2020, we have a spring season. On odd numbered years, you know, 17, 19, we have a fall season. So um, we had this past spring, we had a very good season down there and saw lots of bears and killed some really nice bears. And our next hunting season down on the Alaska Peninsula, that will take place in the fall of 2017. Okay, makes total sense. So, in essence, the, the areas get a break. Yeah, so basically you have two seasons in six months, and then it gets a break for a year and a half. Right, right. Okay, um, that sounds like a really cool hunt. And then you also do grizzly, moose, and goat. Uh, tell me about those. So, I'll, I'll go to the goat real quick because it goes, it goes in line with the sheep. The goats that we hunt are in the Chugach Mountains. And because of the vicinity to Anchorage, they have to be draw or there would be too much pressure on them. So we hunt goats in Eagle River and in the Kinnick Glacier, both in 14C, both draw hunts. Um, both very physical, uh, but the hardest part's getting a tag. We've run virtually 100% success. Um, it's, they're, they're spectacular hunts from... We're, we're dealing with glaciers and, and things like that. Guys just have to show up physically and mentally ready to, to hunt those areas. Um, we got lots of goats. Like I said, the, the problem is drawing a tag. It's not as hard as drawing a uh, sheep tag. We run about 30% success on drawing tags. So if guys are applying for sheep and they're interested in goat, that's a good time to just piggyback it right onto the application and it happens at the same time as sheep. It's the same season. There days. Are, 
It is basically the same seat. No. We hunt goats September 1st through September 10th. Okay. So basically we'll be going into the field the very end of August um, and trying to get done, you know, in the first week of September. Okay. Okay. There are other places in the state of Alaska that goats are over the counter. Um, Kodiak's got some over the counter goats, um, down, you know, you get down in the Wrangles, you get down coastal and Southeast Alaska, they've got over the counter goats. Um, it just depends on, on what guys want to do. Like I said, though, one of the nice things about hunting 14 C from the cost is everybody can get a relatively reasonable flight to Anchorage. We pick them up and, um, and we hunt from there. So, uh, we had, we've had multiple guys who have come hunting with us, um, who have written articles that are on the, the Kuyu blog. So if a guy ever wants to look there at any of them, they can, um, uh, it kind of describes it, but it, they're physically challenging a lot like our sheep hunts. Okay. Good stuff. Um, grizzly and moose. Probably the most fun hunt if you're looking for sheer enjoyable. You know, of course, if, if you know, me and you are going, we're going spe- species specific. If, uh, if I'm taking my dad hunting and he's like, take me hunting for something in Alaska, I'm going to take him for a grizzly or a moose. Um, and I might take him for a hunt where you can do both. It's one of the few animal, it's one of the few hunts that we can combo in the fall. We have a, we have a very, very large grizzly bear moose area um, in northwest Alaska. Um, basically, uh, we have two concessions that butt up against each other. Um, one of them is 100 miles by 100 miles. The other one's 75 by 90. I mean, they're big, and we have uh, very strict quotas on what we can take, so we're not even touching the population. But the grizzly bear hunts, um, so a spring grizzly bear hunt, we can do that hunt every year. So every spring we're doing spring grizzly. Those hunts happen basically from mid-May to mid-June. We're far enough north that we're still dealing with snow. We're still, uh, we got 23 hours of daylight a day. We're not dealing with rubbed hides. And those bears up there, uh, grizzly bears just got a different mindset. They're not as sensitive to our scent trails. We're operating those hunts a lot like we would a sheep hunt but they're not quite as physical. We fly in, land at a spot, we set up camp, but we always have the ability to take provisions for four or five days in a backpack tent and just take off. And the country's really open. We're doing lots of glass. And uh, if we get some bad weather, we set the tent up and we go to sleep because like I said, we got 23 hours a day to hunt. So it is, um, you know, my wife, she likes to go hunting, but she's not like, hey, we, I want to kill this species. So I took her on a couple of grizzly bear hunts, and she loved it. Um, weather's usually pretty good, uh, and you're, you're doing lots of glass in the distance. They're rutting during that time period. You spot a boar in a sow five miles away, well, let's just go. Um, they usually don't move around that much once they get paired up. So the grizzly bear hunts in the spring are a blast. The fall moose-grizzly bear combos it doesn't get any better than that. You're hunting moose during the rut. Um, the moose population's uh, very healthy. We average right at 60. We killed a couple of moose that made Boone and Crockett this last year. Um, and when you're hunting moose and grizzly bear in the fall, it isn't like you're hunting two different areas. One area is for moose and one area is for grizzly bear. You could see a moose and grizzly at any time in the same spot. Um, you just go hunting. And if you see a nice grizzly, let's go kill it. If you see a nice moose, let's go kill it. Um, so that's a super enjoyable type of hunt. Some of the hunts we do in the fall, we float rivers. We kind of, we do whatever we need to to make sure that guys are successful. On um, those hunts, we usually have maybe not a packer in every camp, but once a moose is killed, the ability to get a packer. Um, so that makes it, nice because when one of those moose hits the hits the tundra there's a day there's a day of work there to get it someplace that we can get the super cub in to to fly it out once you do get a moose down can you legally hunt the 
the gut pile uh, for a grizzly? And is it common that the grizzlies then would come to the gut pile, or is that uncommon? Yes, you can legally hunt the gut pile. You cannot move the gut pile in any way to make it more visible. Um, but it's not as easy as everybody thinks. It's not like, hey, we kill a moose and we just sit over it and a bear shows up. It happens sometimes, but that's that's not... Guys ask that question all the time. That's not kind of our our mode. Hey, let's kill a moose first and then we'll find a grizzly. The grizzly in that area, we have a we have a little bit of a fish run, so they might be down on the streams, but we have a tremendous, there's so much tundra, and within the tundra, we have a huge berry crop. So most of the bears that we're killing in the fall, they're up on berries, we're glassing them. Um, when you see one, let's go kill it. Uh, it's, not, it's not as uh, important. We have lots of times that we'll kill the grizzly before we'll kill the moose. So to answer your question, yes. But that's not that's not a guarantee. Kill a moose, then we're going to shoot a grizzly off the gut pile. On on these uh, moose grizzly in the fall, where you're hunting them, and you said you could see them uh, either one at any time. Um, is is that a time frame where you know are you seeing on average are you seeing quite a few animals a day? Meaning you see quite a few moose, see see quite a few grizzlies, or is it still like you know a a two to four a day type of thing. What's, what's, what's that like? So I will say this on the fall hunt. If you see a shooter grizzly, let's go get that. If you shot, if you saw a shooter moose and a shooter grizzly at the same time and everything was the same, let's go kill the grizzly because the chances of us seeing a good moose on a regular basis is better than us seeing a shooter grizzly. You're going to see grizzlies, but, you know, we're trying to get above seven and a half feet. If we saw a nice mature eight foot boar, we need to go kill it. Um, seeing a, you're seeing, you're probably seeing grizzlies every day. And, you know, that country there, unlike the peninsula, the grizzly bear country, you can see much more country and you have a lot less brush. So the animals are more visible. Um, you may see a grizzly at 10 miles away. It doesn't mean you're going to get to him, but if he works that way, you, you know, we're keeping track of him. Uh, the moose population is, is good. We hunt the whole month of September. So in the fall, um, the first part of September, the moose are just starting to, starting to rut by the 10th of September, the rutting. And, you know, even when they're any time during September, you'll have a moose that'll cover 20 miles a day. So it isn't like, Hey, there's no moose here. All of a sudden you could wake up one morning and, you know, there's three bulls that have showed up overnight and they're going to be there for the next couple hours. And then they're going to keep traveling somewhere else. Right. Lance, do you have guys that say, yeah, put me in for all of it. And so they, they apply for the the five or the $10 a chance or whatever. And all of a sudden they draw like, all five. I mean, it, does it ever happen? I mean, cause at that point someone would have a, you know, hundred thousand dollar <laughs> potential. I, I, I mean, does it happen where someone's going to draw three out of the five or is it pretty rare and maybe just one out of the five or, you know, you go years and you don't draw anything. So you can. So if a guy puts in for goat and sheep, puts in for a bison, puts in for a musk ox, and all of a sudden, you could draw them all. Very, very unlikely. Unlikely. We have had a couple guys that have drawn goat and sheep at the same time. Um, my my gut feeling is I tell guys apply for as much stuff as you can. Um, and if you draw them all and you can only do one, figure out you know which one's most important. Those other tags that you do draw, even if you're not going to go, they're not transferable. They just go wasted. And, and the, the game department knows that they know that not everybody's going to go. And, and that's why they're, uh, they take that into account when they're issuing the number of tags that they do. Uh, I recommend guys put in, and if you have that problem where you do drew too many, then that's a great problem to have, but that's pretty unlikely. Okay. My next question would be, um, 
can't do you have grizzly moose hunts both of those species that you can just people can call you up and say i want to buy a tag i don't want to draw or is or are your grizzly and moose hunts all by draw i'll rephrase that the only thing that we have is that's by draw is sheep and goat if a guy says i want a brown bear hunt it's over the counter you want a moose and grizzly hunt it's over the counter um so the guy says hey that's what i want to do give us a call i i will say what's what's been interesting and what we've done and because we have five species we're at about 80 percent return clientele so um what's what's become difficult for guys i call up and i'll say hey I, i'd like to shoot a brown bear mm-hmm. our next spring brown bear opening is 2020 and what what i tried to it's hard to get guys to understand 2020 is going to be here sooner than we think and um i've had multiple guys that say, i don't want to wait that long and then they'll go and book with someone else and call me up and say man the hunt wasn't what i thought it thought now when's your next opening now and they've gotten pushed back even farther so i would say i'm uh, not just speaking for us but all my outfitter friends that i refer guys to that do a good job most guys are a couple years out if, if guys are looking at going, don't let that scare them because these hunts are a lot of money. I totally understand that. It's, they're expensive to operate. But, and the worst thing you could do is get in a rush and, and go on a hunt that isn't exactly what you want because that money is going to be gone. Yeah, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if, if you say your next hunt is 2020 um, and, and you book it now, the, if they book it now, they're in essence, the client is in essence locking in the price. But once 2020 comes, it could be another five or eight or even 10. You know, it could be a lot more money by the time four years rolls around. So is that correct? Absolutely. And, and guys need to understand that, you know, the guys that are doing a good job don't don't have a, a problem. You know, here's. Here's what's interesting. I'm also a client. I, I've went on guided hunts, and, and I think that makes me a better outfitter. And it, it, I, I've been on the other side. Um, so don't think that I'm going to wait and things are going to get less expensive because, you know, they're not. And, and you've seen that, and I've seen that. I, I can tell you right now, the biggest driver of, of costs for us are airplanes and fuel and, and regulations that, 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 that are put on them that require more insurance and, and, and those things get passed down to us and, and we pass them on to the customer. I get it. Makes total sense. Uh, in the summer, uh, do you also do any type of fishing trips or do you, do you, do you refer people that call that want to do fishing or how do you handle that? Fishing trips are are something we do offer. We have, uh, we do three fishing trips down at our lodge on the Alaska Peninsula. And then we also, um, do about three weeks of float trips outside of Anchorage. Um, we fly in, float a river. We've had, we have lots of guys who've come hunting with us that then bring their family back. Both of our trips, um, at the lodge and on the float trip, they're both six. We have stake six guests and we have three guides. Um, it's a great way to show your family Alaska without it being so physical. It's also for guys that are like, you know, I, I don't know these guys. I, I'd rather try to do something that's less expensive. A fishing trip, they come up, they get to meet us. A lot of the same guides that guide hunts for me work in, in fish camp. So they get to see how we operate. They get to see the personality of guys. It's a, it's a great trip. Um, the trips are, you know, we try to make them as inclusive as we can so that it's a, it's easy for guys come to Anchorage. Here's where you go. Here's where you stay. Um, and we try to provide everything so that they're not bringing fishing equipment and, and guys can come and have a great experience in Alaska. And what are you fishing for? Depends on the time of year, but, um, both of our spots carry all five species of salmon that being Kings, reds, chums, silvers, pinks, and then um, 
down on the Alaska Peninsula, we have Arctic char and Dolly Varden, along with rainbows. And on our float trips in South Central Alaska, we have rainbows and we have um, Arctic grayling. But it just, you know, the, the the species of salmon depends on the time of year that guys want to come. If a guy says, hey, I'm really, this is a species I want to target, well, there's a different time of year for him to come. That's all great information. Um, let's take another quick break here. PhoneScope is a company that makes custom-molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. It is simple to text photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. PhoneScope stands behind their product with a 100% money-back guarantee. Get yours now by using the JSCOT16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at Phonescope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot com, or on Instagram, at Phonescope. Okay, Lance, I want to give you a chance, if, if you feel like we haven't covered something and all that we've talked about, give you a chance, but then I also want to ask you about your gear you use on most of these hunts and have you kind of uh, talk for a little bit about uh, the gear that you recommend that people should bring and why. Yeah, the, the only thing I have to say is one of the, the comments that I always get from guys who come up here their first time is, I, I wish I would have done it sooner. Um, and that's something that I'm starting to take to heart. I'm, I'm taking that to heart with my family and my kids is, you know, if you keep putting this stuff off, you never really do it. And especially with the hunts that are physically demanding, it's a lot harder to enjoy them once you've got more aches and pains. Um, so, you know, when guys talk to me about it, that's the one thing I just, I, I reiterate that I, I hear over and over that I wish I would have done this sooner. Yeah. I mean, I, I can relate to that. How old are you, Lance? I'm, I'm 44. So, uh, I feel good and I feel in, in good shape, but you know, I'm, you know, I spend, you know, there's 180 nights in a sleeping bag this year and, and I, I don't think it's going to change, but I got, I got a daughter that's nine and a son that's 10 and they both killed big game animals and, and they just think that that's a way of life. That's awesome. I'm 43 myself, but you definitely notice things when you're hitting your forties and all my buddies that I hunt with that, you know, that are in their 60s are like, yeah, wait till you turn in your 60s, you, you know, but uh, it's definitely not, your body doesn't re react and um, recuperate quite as well as it did in your 20s. Um, but let's, let's talk about some gear. Um, I know you probably spend a lot of time answering gear questions. Um, let's talk about gear for these hunts and, and things, you know, from... Everything from boots to, you know, to, to layering to, every, you know, cover, cover your, give me your gear speech. Gotcha. Well, here's one thing that uh, I think is in Alaska that's hard for guys to understand. What, what works for the guides is not always the same gear that's needed for the client. And, and, and I say that because, um, what we're doing on a day-to-day -day, um, repetitive basis is the best for that, but that might not be the best gear for the client. And, and the biggest one I can think about is, is the backpacks. Um, you know, from the guide standpoint, none of my guides are using any internal frame backpacks. We're using all external frames. We're using frames that are big and it can carry a moose quarter. Um, along with that, we're, we're using a backpack where our rifle can hook onto our frame and can come off very easily. I don't know if you've experienced it, but these internal frame packs, you need to have your rifle strapped to the pack because when it's on, if you just have it shouldered and you're trying the glass, it keeps wanting to fall off your shoulder. Um, and there's some things that have been developed to try to keep them on your shoulders, but it is it's difficult in the sense that um, when we're hunting in Alaska as a guide, I've got to have my rifle readily available all the time. Um, and that's not always the case for the client. We can have his gun strapped to his backpack. 
uh, when we're in bear country, um, we just we just can't do that. So that's one thing. Guys see me uh, wearing a pack, and then they see on the gear list it's not the same. That's the reason why. Okay, makes sense. And and then and then when you're dealing with so you know um, people that are around you know there are lots of companies that are making good stuff, and, and we all have our, our bias. I'm a Kuyu guy. Um, the guys that are there that run to you are friends of mine and, and they're very receptive to recommendations that I give them. Um, Alaska is a unique spot. Stuff that works in lots of places doesn't always work up here in Alaska. But after, you know, after the most important piece of equipment you're going to have to have is your rain gear. We hunt in our rain gear. You know, guys talk about hunting pants and, and what pants they're hunting in. We're hunting in our rain pants all the time. That allows us to sit down, not get wet, um, things like that. Plus, uh, we're trying to, to have something that can handle some abrasion, can handle uh, some rough wear. One thing to remember, when you come to Alaska, you better just plan on it being wet. Uh, our company motto is we specialize in wet, cold, and miserable. Because if you're coming here thinking there's something besides that, you're in the wrong spot. And and guys are always like, man, why do you put that in print? Like I said, communication is, is everything when you're coming. So when you, if, if guys go to our website, we have a very specific gear list for each hunt. Um, you know, one thing that had been real popular is plastic boots in Alaska. Um, they've kind of went away. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm big on having uh, a stiff leather boot that allows you to carry some weight. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting. You need to be able to come up here and have a backpack. Let's typically say, let's say, let's say Jay, me and you were on a brown bear hunt and we kill that bear. It isn't like we're coming back for it tomorrow. That bear's going back to camp with us. Now you kill it right before dark. Unless uh, it'd be a unique circumstance that we wouldn't, stay out all night skinning it and take it back to camp with us. So we get done with the brown bear. Now we got the hide. Well, I got, you know, whatever. It's I got a hundred pound hide. Well, that takes up my whole backpack. So now I got to give you my spot and scope. I got to give you my tripod and I got to give you the skull. Well, you can't show up with my kid's school backpack when you're coming on a hunt. So we recommend guys showing up with a, around a 7,000 cubic inch frame pack. Um, you know, most of my guys are showing up with the Kuyu 7200. That's one that we recommend. Most guys, it's, it's, a, it's a pack that they can use on multiple hunts, and um, it gets big enough that they can put all that stuff in, yet small enough that when we're just going out and they got their camera and lunch, um, that's all they need in there. Uh, so, you know, the backpacks, super important rain gear super important layering is is really important and one one thing guys got to remember on layering is it's got it's got to be set up to where when you're at your coldest you have everything on you can't say well i got this great big jacket for when it gets really cold well if that doesn't fit into your system you can't just be carrying it all everywhere but when it gets really cold or it's just going to wear you out carrying this thing everywhere. So, um, you know, the layering and when you layer to come to Alaska, if you're a large, you can't have a large rain gear jacket because when you put all your layers on, you need to then be able to put on your rain jacket because, um, guys think, well, and it's really cold. We're the coldest when it's 35 degrees raining sideways with a 50 mile an hour wind. It's not, you know, it's not like when you're in Wyoming and it's zero and it's snowing and you can get away with a, with a soft shell. You still need to be able to have your rain gear on. Lance, uh, specifically, I know you're a Kuyu guy. Um, I wear Kuyu gear myself, darn I do. Um, are on those hunts? Are you wearing a super down jacket? Or are you wearing the, the uh, synthetic? Are you wearing the keen eye jacket um, on those hunts? Or, you know, so 
I yep. guess I'm asking when you're wearing a insulated jacket, are you wearing the down, the super down, or are you wearing the keen eye that is the um, that is the synthetic jacket? Unless we are on an early August sheep hunt, the keen eye goes with me everywhere. I love the super down. I take it with me, but the keen eye jacket never comes out of my out of my pack. One thing too in Alaska, guys got to remember, you got to have hoods. I mean, you got to have hoods. Like, don't show up with any of those jackets without the hood, because that's where guys are getting cold. I mean, you know, I have had have a hood with everything, but we are we're going with synthetic and and to, to go into that. But I'm not synthetic on my sleeping bags. The Kuyu Super Down sleeping bag. Um, you know, guys are always, well, what if my sleeping bag gets wet? Well, you know what? I've been saying that for 20 years and it's never been an issue. Um, you know, it's, it's something we keep worrying about that never really happens. So, um, you know, when it comes to sleeping bags, I think Kuyu's got one of the best sleeping bags that we use. But when you're coming hunting and we're talking about layering, you know, my idea is, you know, I'm, I'm about a large, but my rain gear is all extra large. So I can put on my keen eye jacket and put my rain gear over it. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, you know, the, go ahead. the, I was going to say, the other thing, guys, kind of, I get a lot of questions on our boots. And boots are one of those things, like, I got my favorite, I'm a, a Schnee's granite guy. I mean, those are, those are my boots. But, with that being said, boots are a very personal thing. And um, not everybody's feet are the same. And, and if you have something that works for you, you know, I give off, you know, if you got Kenetrek, you got Schnees, you got Mendel, you got uh, Scarpas, if you got something that works for you, your feet like, then that's, that's great. Roll with that. Do not show up experimenting with boots. Um, you know, guys say, hey, I got something and uh, it might be a boot that's not super stiff. Well, we are on uneven ground all the time. Even on our moose and grizzly bear hunts, you're walking on hummocks, you're walking on tundra, it's always rolling. And so, you know, you've got to have a boot that's got some stiffness to it and it's got some ankle support because if your feet go or you, you twist an ankle, then hunt's over. What about trekking poles? Highly recommend. And you don't need two of them. You need one of them. Um, cause if you got two, what do we do when I, it's time to grab your binoculars or what do we do when it's time to grab your rifle? Um, I, I highly recommend, I'm an ice axe guy. Um, I've always been not because I need it for, um, I don't need an ice axe to self arrest or I'm on the ice fields. I need an ice axe. So when we're setting up a tent and there's some dirt there that I need to move out, I can use it as, you know, as a pick or. Or a, or a shovel or something like that. And the same thing when we get somewhere and I need to sit down or we're going to sit here in glass and I dig out a little spot to sit down, uh, the ice axe allows me to do that. Now, I don't, if this guy's not used to an ice axe, that's probably one of those things where just because I have it doesn't mean that the client needs it. But I do recommend they have a trekking pole because when we get into steep terrain and they're not used to side hilling, or we get into something where, you know, you need that extra little bit of balance. It makes a huge difference. Man, I um, feel like we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I really appreciate you spending time with us. Uh, are, are, do you apply in the lower 48 for a lot of other animals yourself? And if so, what? What hunts are you eyeballing or are you about to draw or, or what do you have your eye on? You know, I don't. Partly because uh, our season between spring bear and fi- I'm afraid that I would draw and not have time. Um, and we've kind of gotten to the point where, um, the, you know, Alaska is one of the unique states. And maybe something I should mention is, you know, up here, kids can hunt on their parents' tags at any age, even if they don't have hunter safety. So um, my kids are 9 and 10, and they got their wish list of the things they want to kill next. And so that's 
my hunt have now become taking my kids out and, and letting them hunt animals. And I, I just think, you know, you grow up in Alaska and you want to go hunting and you don't get to go. It's like, why are you here? Um, you know, it, like I said, it's, it's four degrees right now. I mean, and I love it, but the reason you're here during the winter is so that when it comes hunting season, uh, you can go. And so for me personally, um, the only thing I'm eyeballing is if, uh, if Trump starts getting things turned around at fish and wildlife and there's a possibility, it looks like they're going to let us bring polar bears back. You'll see my name on the list. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Um, Lance, I, I want to give you a chance to, well, before, before we get to that, uh, I notice on your, uh, email, you have a Bible verse. It says the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Number six, 24 through 26. How important is your faith? Uh, and it's awesome that you I, I've noticed on your website and stuff you're you're not afraid to say that you're a man of faith. How important is that to you? You know, it's it's our biggest part of our life, my family's life. Uh, you know, our life revolves around our faith, our church, and our business. And I mean that's kind of and that's that's the order it goes in. Um so with faith, family falls right in there. Uh, I, I can't imagine guys spending time out in the wilderness and not being able to see that hey, this wasn't an accident. And I can't imagine someone walking back in the dark down a salmon stream where we've seen 20 brown bears three hours prior and not going, man, I, I'm going to be doing a little bit of praying as I'm walking back home. And those are things that, um, you know, are, are, are so important to me. I'm, there's the, the Lord has blessed me. He's, he's given me a path and he's allowed me to be successful. And that's, um, our family is just, is so blessed. And, and every now and then, you know, I'm out there and, you know, we're on a skiff on the ocean and it's getting rough. And, all of a sudden, I catch myself like, man, I should, I should be paying a little more attention to the Lord and what He what He has for me. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I, like I said, us guides, we got egos and we got agendas and we got things we want to do. And I, he He checks me at the door every now and then. Um, I, I'm I'm always trying to be conscious of that. So it is a huge part of our lives. That's awesome. I want to give you a chance to tell the listeners how they can reach you. Uh, and again, if they want to apply before the deadline, they can contact you. So um, why don't you do that? Uh, give the listeners the best way for them to, to get a hold of you guys. The, the best way to get a hold of us is to uh, go to our website, at, which is freelanceoutdooradventures.com. There's a contact us, or you can just send us an email directly to freelanceoa at mac.com. Um, those are the best way. Email is the best way to get a hold of us. Uh, my wife is constantly dealing with the business. Like I said, this is a, a family-run business. This is, this is what we do. That's the best way to get a hold of us. And if guys are interested in applying, uh, the sooner the better. We're going to be doing that till Thursday evening making sure everybody gets applied. And if you got questions, send me an email. Um, we'll email you right back. If you want to talk on the phone, uh, it's, it's good to try to get scheduled because uh, i got guys that are, are wanting to ask questions about that. Send us an email. We'll, we'll schedule a time that we can get on the phone and, and get any questions answered that anyone might have. That's awesome. And then you've also got uh, a show schedule. What shows are you going to coming up this spring in case uh, listeners want to uh, come shake your hand, meet you face to face and, uh, schedule a hunt with you. We will be at the wild sheep foundation, which is going to be in Reno. And we will also be at the safari club international show, which will be in Las Vegas. Um, I believe the wild sheep foundations, January 19th through the 21st. 
and the SCI show, I believe, is the first part of February. Um, but we will be at both of those, both me and my wife. Um, you know, she's just as big a part of, of the business as, as I am. And matter of fact, after guys have come with us once, they tend to want to talk to her more than me anyway. <laughs> she becomes the most popular person. I want to talk to Nikki. I don't care about Lance. <laughs> well, yeah, because once they book the hunt, all the correspondence and, and she, you know, people, people sometimes forget all the correspondence. You start dealing with license and tags. You start dealing with uh, waivers and contracts and payment schedules. And, and she's on top of that to where, um, like I said, I can't reiterate how important communication is with guys and um and you just see when guys are doing these big hunts and they're spending this kind of money and you're seeing you've seen it in the news people with legal problems because the outfitter didn't have his his act together um we just don't want any part of that and so she does a great job of making sure we have everything in order that's awesome well buddy thanks for spending so much time with us here and uh appreciate the Appreciate it, and uh, I'll come look you up. I'm going to be at SCI. I'm going to still be in Mexico cooster hunting for the sheep show. So that's all. The sheep show always falls in a bad time because the cooster are still running down in Mexico. But uh, I'll come look you up at SCI, and um, just thanks for spending time, and God bless you and your family, and uh, thanks for running a top-notch business, and uh, uh, look forward to having you on again uh, down the road here. And, uh, yeah, keep plugging away. All right. Well, sounds great, and uh, Merry Christmas to everybody, and uh, hopefully everybody has a, a safe Christmas season. Sounds good, buddy. You take care, okay? <laughs>